will come to order. At this time, I will ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. I recognize the senator from the 28th. Speak to the journal. Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. President. What a fine day it is today on National Chip and Dip Day. It's National Puppy Day. That was for the First Lady of the Senate. National Tamale Day, Cuddly Kitten Day, and National Organize Your Home Office Day. But we'll probably all have to put that on pause till next week. We got a great lineup of pages today. We got Braden Howell, Maddie Corson, Carly Tomlinson, Nico Carpenter, Jackson Bennett, Darshpreet Kaur, William Stevens, Sarah Young, John Henry Causey, Catherine Causey, and Alex Duke. Pages. We look forward to working with y'all today, and we thank you for your service. Y'all give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Mr. President, the journal has been read and found to be correct, and it's getting really thick. All right, all right. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. Senator, I went and picked up a tea today. It's called, and I, and I called, it's called a Georgia peach. And they put a sticker on here, and it said, be positive. And I just appreciate your positive attitude on everything, uh, Senator. You know, so we appreciate that. The journal has been read. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading of the journal? The chair hears none, and the reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. We have first reading and references of Senate bills. Secretary? Senate Bill 322 by Senator Walker III of the 20th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to the Sheriff's Retirement Fund of Georgia so as to provide for an increase in dues, to provide for an increase in the sum to be paid for purchasing prior service Retirement. credit. Senate Bill 223 by Senator Ginn of the 47th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to general provisions regarding provisions of applicable State and counties. local government. Senate Bill 324 by Senator Jackson of the 41st and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to state printing and documents so as to provide for a victim-centered address confidentiality Judiciary. program. Senate Bill 325 by Senator Rahman of the 5th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to dispensing opticians so as to exempt from licensure an employee of a licensed physician. Health and Human Services. Senate Bill 326 by Senator Beach of the 21st, a bill to meet the Island Act relating to powers of local governments as to air facilities. Transportation. Senate Bill 327 by Senator Williams of the 25th, a bill to be dialed an act relating to retirement and pensions so as to permit certain persons who would otherwise be required to be members of the public school employees retirement system to make an irrevocable retirement. election. Senate Resolution 370 by Senator Davenport of the 44th and others, a resolution honoring the life of Miss Minnie Melton Saxton and dedicating a road in her memory and for other purposes. Transportation. Senate Resolution 371 by Senator Hatchett of the 50th and others, a resolution creating the Senate Study Committee on Rural Rules. Medical. Senate Resolution 372 by Senator Watson of the 1st and others, a resolution supporting the improvement of the care of atherosclerotic cardiovascular Health and disease. Human services. Senate Resolution 376 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, a resolution urging the United States Congress to pass. Transportation. Senate Resolution 383 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, a resolution creating the Senate Study Committee on Railway Safety and for other purposes. Banking. SR 383 is rules, correction, rules. Senate Resolution 390 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others, a resolution recognizing March Banking. 2023. Senate Resolution 392 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others, a resolution recognizing Rules. Laura. Senate Resolution 394 by Senator Summers of the 13th and others, a resolution creating the Senate Study Committee on the creation of Rules. a robust. That completes the order, Mr. President. First reading references of House bills. House Bill 716 by Representative Lumsden of the 12th and others, a bill. Government. 
House Bill 727 by Representative Deloach and the 167th, a bill being titled an act providing a new charter for the city of Darien so as to increase a residency requirement to one year to provide re related matters to repeal State conflicting laws. House Bill 731 by Representative Jenner of the 85th and others, a bill being titled an act. Government. House Bill 372 by Representative Green of the 154th, a bill to be entitled State an act to authorize government. House Bill 733 by Representative Gladney of the 130th State and others. Local government. House Bill 735 by Representative Gunter of the 8th, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize State local government. House Bill 739 by Representative Sebao of the 34th and others, a bill to be entitled an act. Local, local government. House Bill 740 by Representative Williams of the 168th and others, a bill to be entitled House Bill 742 by Representative Green of the 154th, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize State the assessment. That completes the order, Mr. President. First reading references to Senate bills and resolutions. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Standing President. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Children and Families has had under consideration the following legislation has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 144, due pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd District Chairman. Senate Committee on Finance has had under consideration the following legislation has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 86 do pass by substitute. House Bill 454 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Huffstetler of the 52nd District Chairman. Senate Committee on Higher Education has had under consideration the following legislation has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 122 do pass by substitute. House Bill 249 do pass by substitute. House Bill 319 do pass by sub uh, do pass. Respectfully submitted by Senator Hickman of the 4th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 280 do pass. House Bill 63 do pass. House Bill 362 do pass. House Bill 295 do pass. House Bill 315 do pass. House Bill 384 do pass. Respectively submitted by Senator Walker of the 20th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Public Safety has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 301 do pass by substitute. House Bill 348 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Regulated Indu Industries and Utilities has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 530 do pass by committee substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Kausser of the 46th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Regulated Industries and Utilities has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 196 do pass by committee substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Kausser to the 46th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Rules has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Resolution 37 do pass. Senate Resolution 85 do pass. Senate Resolution 121 do pass. Senate Resolution 144 do pass. Senate Resolution 147 do pass. Senate Resolution 155 do pass. Senate Resolution 159 do pass. Senate Resolution 186 do pass by substitute. Senate Resolution 203 do pass. Senate Resolution 251 do pass. Senate Resolution 273 do pass. Senate Resolution 275 do pass. Senate Resolution 279 do pass. Senate Resolution 282 do pass. Senate Resolution 286 do pass. Senate Resolution 293 do pass. Senate Resolution 296 do pass. Senate Resolution 314 do pass. Senate Resolution 323 do pass. Senate Resolution 354 do pass. Respectfully submitted by Senator Brass of the 28th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on SOGA has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 303 do pass. Senate Bill 309 do pass. Senate Bill 310 do pass. Senate Bill 311 do pass. Senate Bill 312 do pass. Senate Bill 313 do pass. Senate Bill 314 do pass. Senate Bill 315 do pass. Senate Bill 316 do pass. Senate Bill 317 do pass. House Bill 540 do pass. House Bill 547 do pass. House Bill 597 do pass. House Bill 631 do pass. House Bill 666 do pass. House Bill House Bill 693 do pass. House Bill 694 do pass. House Bill 708 do pass. Respectfully submitted by Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Sogo General has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 374 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Transportation has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 121 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted by Senator Dolezal of the 27th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. It is now time for the morning. Second readers. 
Senate Resolution 37 by Senator James of the 35th and other Senate Property Owners Associations, Homeowners Associations, and Condominium Associations Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 85 by Senator Walker III of the 20th and other Senate Occupational Licensing Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 121 by Senator Butler of the 55th and other Senate Helping Georgia Students Overcome COVID-19 Related Learning Loss Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 144 by Senator Estevez of the 6th and other Senate Expanding Early Childhood Education Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 147 by Senator Mallow of the 2nd and others Senate Local Local Option Sales Tax Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 155 by Senator Ann Vitarte of the 31st and others. Senate Truck Driver Shortage Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 159 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others. Senate Study Committee on the Parenting Time Deviation in Georgia's Child Support Guidelines Statute. Code Section 19615 create. Senate Resolution 186 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others. Georgia Federation of Democratic Women, Women in Blue Day recognized February 23rd, 2023. Senate Resolution 203 by Senator Jones of the 10th and others. Senate State Firearms St Storage Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 251 by Senator Davenport of the 44th. Senate Rosenwald Studies Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 273 by Senator Albers of the 56th and others. Senate EMS Reform Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 275 by Senator Albers of the 56th and others. Senate Study Committee on Expanding Georgia's Workforce create. Senate Resolution 279 by Senator Dolezal of the 27th and others. Senate Study Committee on Certificate of Need Reform create. Senate Resolution 282 by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd and others. Senate Study Committee on Foster Care and Adoption create. Senate Resolution 286 by Senator Beach of the 21st and others. Senate Minority Business Enterprises, Women Owned Businesses, and Veteran-Owned Businesses and State Contracting Study Committee create. Senate Resolution 293 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others. Senate Study Committee on an Equity Impact Tool for Legislation create. Senate Resolution 296 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others. Senate Study Committee on Excessive Vehicle Noise and Related Crimes create. Senate Resolution 314 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others. Senate Study Committee on the Benefits of Solar Energy in Georgia create. Senate Resolution 323 by Senator Jones II of the 22nd and others. Senate Study Committee on Improving Family Caregiver Services create. Senate Resolution 354 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others. Senate Study Committee on the Effects of Cannabis Use create. House Bill 63 by Representative Williams of the 148th and others. Insurance. Insurers providing policies for groups of 20 or more to furnish claims experience at the request of a group policyholder require. House Bill 86 by Representative Rhodes of the 124th and others. Sales and use tax. Sales of tangible personal property used for or in the renovation or expansion of certain aquariums exempt. House Bill 121 by Representative Anderson of the 10th and others, waters, ports, and watercraft, wake surfing and wakeboarding provide restrictions and requirements. House Bill 122 by Representative Hawkins of the 27th and others, Georgia Achieving a Better Life Experience, governance of program by Board of Directors of Georgia Higher Education Savings Plan provide. House Bill 144 by Representative Lewis Ward of the 115th and, and others, George L. Burgess Act and Act, House, House Bill 249 by Representative Martin of the 49th and others, education needs based financial aid program provide definition. House Bill 280 by Representative Gamble of the 15th and others, insurance, additional value-added products or services that are excluded from being unfair prey practices and unlawful inducements provide. House Bill 295 by Representative Hawkins of the 27th and others. Insurance, consumer protections against surprise billing, revise certain procedures. House Bill 301 by Representative Ridley of the 6th and others, motor vehicles and traffic, revise amount of mon civil monetary penalty for violations of improperly passing a school bus or speeding in a school zone. House Bill 315 by Representative T Taylor of the 173rd and others, Commissioner of Insurance, promulgate rules and regulations regarding cost-sharing requirements for diagnostic and supplemental breast screening examinations provide. House Bill 319 by Representative Martin of the 49th, Education abolished Georgia Higher Education Assistance Corporation. House Bill 348 by Representative Collins of the 71st and others. Motor vehicle standards for signs, warning of use of automated traffic enforcement safety devices provide. House Bill 362 by Representative Mathiak of the 74th and others. Insurance benefit provider to disclose certain payments to a treating health care provider provide. House Bill 374 by Representative Thomas of the 21st and others. Local government, municipal de-annexation, repeal certain provisions. House Bill 384 by Representative Henderson of the 113th Insurance Annual Notification by Insurers to Mail Insurers of Coverage for Prostate-Specific Antigen Tests provide. House Bill 454 by Representative Blackman of the 146 and others, Revenue and Taxation, Internal Revenue Code and Internal Revenue Code of 1986 Revised Terms. House Bill 530 by Representative Birch of the 176 and others. Civil Practice Protective Orders for Certain High-Ranking Officers provide. That completes the order, Mr. President. House Bill, House Bill 196, a bill by Representative Powell of the 33rd, 
A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 9 of Chapter 12 of Title 16 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to access to medical cannabis so as to provide that the Georgia Access to Medical Cannabis Commission shall be subject to the Administrative Procedure Act and laws governing opening governing open meetings and open records to provide for related matters to repeal conflicting laws and for other purposes. That completes the order, Ms. President. It is now time for the morning roll call. All senators, please take your seats and cease all audible conversation. I would ask that the doorkeepers secure the chamber at this time. It, is there any senators that would like to excuse another senator? A senator from the 27th. What purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 48th. Without objection, the senator from the 48th is excused. Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senators from the 26th, 22nd, the 20th, the 42nd, 55, 35, 34. Whoa, Senator. Oh. You, you, your whole team's gone here, man. 39. <laughs> Senator from the 34th is here. Okay. Thank you, sir. Recognize majority leader for a motion. Yes, sir. Due to the House Rules meeting in, at this time, I motion we suspend roll call. Suspend. The majority leader has moved that we suspend roll call. Might be a wise decision. Any objection? Without objection, we will suspend roll call. It is now uh, my pleasure to, uh, I, I get to have the pastor of the day today, to tell you the truth. If the doorkeepers will secure the door, we've got, uh, we're going to have our, get ready for our Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll get ready for our pastor of the day. So if everybody would take their seats. I know as y'all used to doing the roll call, but since we suspended roll call, we're going to jump right in here. Let me get everybody's attention. We're getting ready to do the devotion here. It is my pleasure and, uh, to have uh, my good friend Eric Thomas, a, a native Atlantean, here today uh, as our pastor of the day. He is uh, someone who has uh, um, meant a lot to me through the years, and uh, I am so uh, honored to have him with us today. He is somebody who has uh, pastored St. Peter's Church here in Atlanta for many, many years and, uh, and done a wonderful job in the city of Atlanta uh, witnessing and, and uh, uh, ministering uh, to so many here in the city as well as I, I met him because we were both Woodward Academy graduates and he used to... Um, he used to come and, and do our uh, devotion uh, on Friday nights before football games. And so uh, I've gotten to know him. And, and you always remember those, those guys from, uh, that, uh, that do a really good job uh, in moments like that. And I uh, always admired, admired his skill set uh, as, a, as a minister, but also got to know him as an individual and really uh, uh, enjoy uh, hearing him, hearing his, hearing his devotions, and and um, and so we're going to do the pledge of allegiance, and then I'm going to let the pastor step step right up to the podium here. After that, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Georgia flag. Pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag and to the rituals which it stands. Wisdom, justice, and moderation occur. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today, and it is a pleasure certainly to be here. Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today and join this uh, August body. Uh, it is a pleasure to be a Lantern, it's a pleasure to be a Georgian. It's a pleasure to be able to stand here in this season at this time to say just a few words of encouragement and hopefully challenge and inspiration as well. Uh, in the book of Joshua, um, about the third chapter, the people of Israel prepared to go over uh, the Jordan River 
uh, God gave Joshua some instruction as regards to what was to be done as they crossed over. Uh, there was no bridge uh, there. There was no bridge to take them over. So there was a challenge because at the season they were going over, uh, there was a great amount of water flow for the Jordan. It was a harvest season. As a result, uh, it wouldn't be easy to cross over the Jordan River. Uh, but God promised uh, Joshua that he would back up the Jordan River so that the people could walk over into the promised land on dry land. And so even as they crossed, uh, the instruction was given that as the priests came to the very edge of the Jordan, they didn't have to step in, they stepped to the very edge of the Jordan River, uh, that the river would stop and the flow stopped. And the flow stopped long enough for the entire nation of Israel to cross over on dry land. But the specific instruction that God gave Joshua was that, that when the crossing was over, when they had crossed successfully over to the land that God had promised to give them, uh, that they would take one stone, each leader of each tribe would take one stone, each priest would take one stone, and from it, they would build a monument, a memorial to what had taken place that day. Uh, the memorial was to remind the future generations of what God had done for them. It was to remind the future generations of what God had done through them and to remind future generations of what God was capable of doing. And so certainly after they had crossed over successfully the Jordan River, uh, the 12 stones were taken and stacked up. Uh, and as Joshua said, they were able to be, to be a memorial forever. And as I began to think about this years ago, I began to think that any time a legislative body meets there, are stones that are being left as a memorial of what God has done through that body, whether it's the city council, the county commission, school board, uh, the house, uh, and the senate. That each vote, each thing that's laid down is a vote, each vote that is cast, each piece of legislation is a reminder uh, of what God has done and what God will do as his people uh, operate in obedience to him. And so I just want to challenge you all today to continue uh, to seek God and in, in, in in guidance as you do this great work that you're doing to transform uh, this state, uh, to strengthen the lives of those who live in this state. Uh, but do it in remembrance that God has given us this work to do in order that future generations will look back and see what was done through you all. And so that's my challenge and my charge today. And I'm grateful for the work that's been done up to this 38th day of this session. And I pray that God will continue to do that great work in your midst. Let us pray. Most holy and all wise God, our Father, we come this day, first of all, acknowledging this is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing even in this day, and we are glad in it. We thank you, Lord, and I thank you for those who are here, the 56 senators, Lord, that you've assigned and you've placed here uh, in this state and in this body today to serve you. I thank you, Lord, for the 37 previous days, Lord, in which they've worked very diligently to hammer out legislation that be beneficial to all of Georgia. And I thank you, Lord, for this 159th session in which you have continued, Lord, to move this state forward. And we pray, God, now as they continue to do this work today, that you would give them insight, give them direction, give them strength, and give them courage, Lord, to stand on what you have assigned them to do. I pray, God, this day you bless this governor of this body, my friend, your servant, Bert Jones, and I pray, God, that you would bless him and bless each person in this chamber today to be able to live victoriously, Lord, as they do successfully the work you've called them to do. I pray, Lord, that you would move in this place, Lord, that there be um, moments of clarity. I pray, God, that you move in this place, Lord, so there be unity, uh, Lord, in accomplishing the goals in which you place before each of them. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and the mercy that you show to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that you've made available to all of us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can completely and confidently trust in you in all things. And we pray, God, that that would be manifest in this building today, in this group today, and every individual in this building today. We say thank you in the name of him who is able to keep us from falling. Amen.
So it's always nice to uh, introduce and recognize the uh, physicians, doctors of the day here, and uh, we appreciate them volunteering their time to come down here and and uh, be a be a part of the 40-day session. Uh, and I reckon I want to recognize our senator from the sixth to introduce our doctor of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. It is an honor to introduce the doctor of the day, who is a constituent and a resident of Senate District 6. Uh, Dr. Alice Frey is an emergency uh, doctor who grew up in Lithonia, Georgia. She attended Xavier University in Louisiana and Howard University College of Medicine, and she received her doctoral degree in 2008. She completed her residency training in emergency re medicine at East Carolina University and, my, and did her residency in, uh, in addition to ECU, she did it in Maimonides, 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 Maimonides uh, Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. She returned to Atlanta shortly after that and has worked in multiple hospitals in Metro Atlanta and in Georgia, and she currently works for Kaiser Permanente for the last five years. So let's welcome Dr. Frey. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Frey. It is my pleasure to serve as your doctor of the day. Thank you for all of the service that you provide to the citizens of Georgia. Thank you. All right, thank you. It is now time for our points of personal privilege, and uh, the senator from the 35th is uh, already in the well, and uh, we just, we, it, the floor is yours, Senator. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Senators, this is an exciting day because it's Mars Brown Day at the Capitol. <laughs> we have up in the gallery, uh, Morris Brown College President, Kevin James. Morris Brown uh, President Assistant, Attorney Michelle Cook. Dr. Faroki is right here. He was my professor a million years ago when I was there. And, um, oh, Lord, the list goes on. Um, Tillman Ward, who I went to the school with, Walter Jordan, Alonzo Gaines, uh, Patron Hoke, M Manisha Holiday, Oliver Huff. Oliver Huff, y'all, Mary Hemphill, Juanita Hoke, uh, and uh, Chuck Barlow, our Reverend Chuck Barlow, who's been with us and our alumni for many years. Joy Lynch, Utrilla, Lindsay, Ashley Davis, Pamela Stanley, and Tanisha Farmer. But we have a whole lot more.
because we also have a, a resolution that it passed for us uh, recognizing March 20, uh, 2023 as Mars Brown Day at the Capitol. So we are very, very excited about it. Please stand and receive a warm welcome from the State Senate, all of the Mars Brown and the President, and Dr. Faroki, Dr. Faroki over here, and all. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the opportunity to to recognize our movers and shakers of, a, uh, of Morris Brown College that started in 1913 in uh, Big Bethel AME Church basement. Uh, and and uh, it's still, that is uh, down the street from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's church. And it's still there and it's still going. And the AME Church started Morris Brown College. Amen. <laughs> And, and uh, I'm just, I was on the board with, with so many people and so many bishops, Dr. Faroki and so many others, and we have our accreditation back. So I want you to know that Mars Brown never closed. Thank you. Uh, it's always nice to have a uh, special guest here today, and uh, uh, we uh, we always like to recognize uh, those and those and from a lot of different angles in here in the state, and particularly those in public service and some of the work that they do. And it's it's my honor uh, today to have uh, be able to recognize one of my good friends, Michael Thurman, here today. Sec yeah. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Resolution 395 by Senator Jackson of the 41st and others, a resolution recognizing March 23, 20, 2023 as DeKalb Day and for other purposes, whereas founded on Mar December 9, 1822 on Ge as Georgia's 56th county, DeKalb County will celebrate its bicentennial this year and whereas named after Baron Johann DeKalb, who aided the colonists in their fight for independence. And whereas it is abundantly fitting and proper that this remarkable county be appropriately recognized during this special time. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize March 23, 2023 as DeKalb Day in honor of DeKalb County's bicentennial. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to the resolution? Chair hearing none, the resolution is adopted. I said we were, yeah, well, you can give it a handshake, yeah. Obviously, today is DeKalb County Day, but I just associate Michael Thurman with DeKalb County, so I, <laughs> that's why I'm saying this. I'm proud to celebrate DeKalb County and their CEO as well. But uh, we, we're great. It's great to have the the leadership here. It's great to have all the Senate members here today. And I can tell you, the Michael has been a great. I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag on him a little bit because he has been a great CEO. Been great to work with. Uh, had a pro he had, he and I worked on a project a couple years ago. Uh, that impacted my hometown, and uh, it was a it was a good environmental project. That uh, it was one of those rare projects that everybody walked away happy from. And uh, and uh, but it couldn't have happened without uh, his leadership and his help. So I appreciate him for that. Uh, Senator from the 41st, 41st is going to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my great honor to uh, present a resolution to DeKalb County, to our CEO on this great DeKalb County Day, celebrating 200 years. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way because uh, CEO Thurman, that's, we all want to hear from you. So, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator. To the Lieutenant Governor, who is a friend of long standing, as he mentioned, we worked together on many projects to our leader of the DeKalb delegation, Senator Jackson, to the men and women who represent DeKalb in this Senate. I want to thank you for your leadership and your support and your friendship. And I want to thank this delegation, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Larry Johnson. I want to thank them and the members of this body 
for passing our SPLOS II legislation, which will generate $600 million in ad valorem tax relief for DeKalb County homeowners and $600 million in capital improvements. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the Georgia State Senate. Thank you. Uh, it's time for points of personal privilege. Uh, Senator from the night, to recognize you. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I rise today to honor Gwinnett Chat Outreach. Y'all know I love all things Gwinnett. Founded by Ryan Cox, a transplant of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Not native of Georgia, but nobody's perfect. This organization's goal is to provide opportunities for young people and help Gwinnett communities be healthy and well cared for, informed and thriving. They believe that no teen should be left behind because they lack the access to resources. Among many events, Gwinnett Ch Chat Outreach gives teens the opportunity to visit businesses behind the scenes to learn about their operations. They conduct college tours, and they have hosted golf tournaments in which teams can be paired with business leaders in the area to gain insight into their own journeys. Gwinnett Chat Outreach partners with community leaders, businesses, and the community itself 
to develop and conduct public service programs. The number of lives positively impacted by this organization is beyond count. And we are grateful for their work in the Gwinnett County community. Would you guys welcome Gwinnett Chat Outreach. They're over here in the corner. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. You know, it's always an honor to have uh, former colleagues that are here, and uh, we got a special one here with us today, and I'm going to, you know, because we, we miss uh, so many things that he did around this chamber, and he did it for a long time, but Jeff Mullis, why don't you come on up here? Let's give Jeff Mullis a round of applause. <laughs> why don't you say a few words there, Jeff? Uh. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friends, it's such a pleasure to be back here with you for just a moment. And I miss all of y'all. Well, some of y'all. Well, a few of y'all. No, I'm kidding. Look, this is an honorable place. I enjoy serving in this unique, uh, extinct chamber. It's amazing. And I appreciate the friendship that we've all had for years. I enjoyed working with you. If I can ever be of service to you in any way, please give me a call because I appreciate you. <laughs> Y'all have a good day. Oh, uh, uh, recognize the senator from the 28th. Mr. President, parliamentary inquiry. Well, state your inquiry. Is it not true that the former chairman from the 53rd is the last good rules chairman we ever had in this? <laughs> senator chamber? knows what he speaks. <laughs> recognize the senator from the 34th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise first and foremost just to say that um, a longtime history maker, former Senator Nadine Thomas, was here in the um, Capitol today. And it was just a pleasure just to see her because she kind of mentored me when I came. But more importantly, I rise because on tomorrow, my husband and I have our one and only grand girl. She will be turning 16, and I know you can't see it from there, but the button I'm wearing is when she was first born this time, and I just get so emotional because I got four awesome grandchildren, but that one little girl, she's the apple of her granddaddy's eye. At any rate, I just say happy birthday, Janae Vacari. She used to wear a crown, too. She has been a little bit of everything. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll yield the will. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry, did you? You turn off? You got it on? I just wanted to make sure you all knew she is 16. It's a sweet 16. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We're going to go out of order a little bit. It's a point of personal privilege, but I'm letting him have it from the roster here. The Dean of the Senate, uh, Ed Harbinson, would like to recognize a special person here today. Senator? 
Thank you, Mr. President. It gives me a great deal of pleasure today to introduce a long, long-time friend of mine, Maria Boynton. Maria Boynton and I go way back uh, when we were working as news reporters and director at WOKS and Foxy 105 in Columbus, Georgia. I hired her, and she has not looked back, so I will read some of her bio information right now. Whereas Dr. Maria Boynton, PhD, is a distinguished radio morning news anchor with B103 and WAOK Radio, as well as host of Atlanta Up Close, and she's been a champion and advocate of empowerment for marginalized communities, families, and individuals. Whereas Dr. Boynton is a proud alumna of Albany State University, where she was a student leader on the university's disciplinary committee. Whereas Dr. Boynton has been a member of the Atlanta Press Club, Society of Professional Journalists, National Council of Negro Women Greater Atlanta Section, National Kidney Foundation League of Women Voters, Atlanta Fulton County, Atlanta NAACP, National Panhellenic Council, whereas as a member of Delta Sigma Theta, a public service organization, she is committed to boldly confronting challenges that African Americans face on a wide range of programs, whereas Dr. Boynton is also a member of Tall Beta Sigma National Band Sorority Honorary Service and leadership organization serving college and university band programs through service projects, fundraiser and, fundraisers, and et cetera. Whereas Dr. Boynton has been honored many times throughout her career, including two Peabody Awards, two DuPont Awards for collaborative efforts, various Associated Press Awards, and Atlanta Association of Black Journalists Award, recognition through a re resolution of the Georgia House of Representatives, that doesn't count, for her career and community contributions, and recognized as international trailblazer, being named among Atlanta's top 100 black women of influence by the Atlanta Business League, and in induction, she's been inducted into the Georgia Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Now, therefore, it be resolved that Dr. Maria Boynton is recognized and commended for her many years of valuable service to the state of Georgia and broadcasting generally. Let's welcome Maria Boynton. The Lieutenant Governor said, yeah, just a couple of minutes. Wow, this is awesome. I was coming down here with Nan Oreck. I've been coming down here with Mary Mark Oliver. I was here with one of the best men I knew, Johnny Isaacson. So everybody, I've been coming down since Joe Frank Harris, and of course, this is awesome for me. I love you all. I was talking to Sergeant at Arms Brown, and he said, if only people knew the love that comes in this place. And I wish that the media could show more and more of the love that you are truly here working for the people, and that you do not dislike each other. You actually like each other. Thank you so much for this, everybody. Love you all. Recognize the senator from the fourth for appointed personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think one of our key words this uh, this session is is literacy. So I'm very proud today to have um, three individuals in our um, balcony that work for an organization called Reach Out and Read. And Reach Out and Read couple of things you got on your desk is this pamphlet which explains what they do. Other great thing you got on your desk are, are these, these these two books. And um, Senator Watson from the excuse me, Senator from the first, Senator First had told me that uh, particularly the Barnyard Dance is a book that he's read to his grandchildren before. So let me tell you a little bit about this organization. But first of all let me ask uh, in the balcony uh, Miss Kim Erickson, director of Reach Out and Read to stand up. Over here to the left. Then we got Miss Carolina Clinker, a program manager. Thank you. And then Kim Thomas, another program manager. Thank you all for being here. So let me tell you a little bit about this organization. Uh, did, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> so reach out, and, reach out and read. Uh, the early literature intervention began in 1989 at Boston Medical Center and it expanded into 50 states serving 507 million families today. Georgia's affiliate uh, started in 2012 and now 
now serves 189,700 children and families in 72 counties at 193 hospitals, pediatric practices, clinics, home visiting program sites, with 122 medical sites that have applications in progress to re become reach out and read sites. And over 1,000 medical providers and staff have been trained in the reach out and read program, offering each child an opportunity to read. Reach out and read has trained 36,000 pediatricians and medical providers. Over the past 12 months, 379,400 well child checkups have happened and probably 189,000 of those uh, children were, con were conducted across Georgia with pediatricians and providers implementing this program. In the same time, 215, 215,793 new children books were distributed through the program's pediatric network, children aged five years and younger. I think, I think we've said so many times that we can't wait till these children get into school for them to start reading. And, 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 and I think uh, Monday we'll have uh, two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate that will address literacy. Uh, I thank y'all and, and um, I thank Reach Out and Read people for being here today. And um, I yield the well, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 12th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to welcome to the Capitol Go Vote Georgia. This is an organization, and would you guys please stand and be recognized? Regardless to what party affiliation you belong to, you need a vote when it's time for election. So these individuals work to help educate voters, to get help get voters to the polls, and we appreciate everything that you guys do. So continue to do the good work uh, for all Georgians. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. President. Recognize the Senator from the fifth for a point of personal privilege. Mr. President, colleagues and friends, today is the first day of Ramadan. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, a significant holy month in the Islamic faith. It is celebrated as a month when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the first verses of the Holy Quran from Allah, God. The Muslim community fast this month from sunrise to sundown. It is also the time where Muslims practice spiritual reflection, self-restraint, and being reminded of their responsibilities and obligation to take care of the underprivileged as well. Ramadan Mubarak to all the Muslims in Georgia and around the world. Ramadan this month, may everyone celebrating have a blessed month of devotion, fasting, and, refresh and reflection. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the word. Recognize the senator from the 54th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my friends, last year I was able to, uh, twice I got to come to this well in this esteemed body, once for Dalton Day, and came, everybody got their rug for the year of 2022, but then late in the session I was able to come to the well for a second time because our Georgia Bulldogs had won a national championship. Well, this year I got to come to this well and everybody got their rugs for Dalton Day via the Dalton Chamber of Commerce and us being the four manufacturing capital of the world but this year I get to come back a second time. And because of that reason that we all know, and we're all so proud because Georgia won back-to-back -back national championships. So this year's rug that everyone will receive says back-to-back -back national championships. These are in the mailroom and every, they'll be delivered to everyone's office tomorrow. 
Go dogs. I like that. Thank you so much, Senator. Give him a, give him another round of applause right there. I look forward to next year's design too. So thank you, Senator, very much, very much. I recognize the Senator from the 39th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, colleagues. I would like to recognize a young woman today who is standing in the back who was recently crowned Miss Atlanta's Teen, Mara Eva Klein. She was crowned in August as Miss Atlanta's Teen and will be competing for Miss Georgia's Teen in Columbus in June, in which the winner will go on to compete at Miss America's Teen. She is a senior at Buford High School. Her talent is opera singing, and she promotes her platform of Safe in the Sun, Melanoma Awareness, and Prevention. Please join me in welcoming um, Mara Eva to the Senate. I wanted to also, while I'm up here, um, also remember on what would be his 85th birthday, the late great Mayor Maynard Jackson, who was born on this day in 1938, and this year actually marks the 20th year of his passing, which is hard to believe. Um, He's had deep, deep ties to Atlanta. He entered Morehouse College through a special early entry program and graduated when he was only 18. He went on to law school. And of course, in 1969, when he was elected mayor of the city of Atlanta, it marked the beginning of Atlanta's shift from just a city in the south to Atlanta, an international city recognized worldwide. He was a stalwart champion of minority supplier and diversity and making sure that minority businesses received more municipal contracts. He got into a lot of rifts with people for this, but Atlanta continues to be a model recognized throughout the country. His political and business prominence um, led him on to start many businesses, including the one with my husband, Jackman Hospitality, and he served on many, many boards, um, including Morehouse College, which he went to and loved, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Georgia Department of Industry, Trade, and Tourism, which of course we now know as the Georgia Department of Economic Development. He died of a heart attack unexpectedly in Washington, D.C., like I said 20 years ago in June, and he remains greatly missed, and um, I wanted to recognize him on this his heavenly 85th birthday. If you would join me for just a moment of silence. Senators ask for a that. moment of silence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Recognize a Senator from the 10th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. As a franchise for dealer in McDonough, Georgia, I rise to invite all of you to join with us on Monday, the 27th of March from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for Dealer Day. Uh, the automobile franchise dealers in the great state of Georgia, there's well over 500 of us. We employ over 75,000 and create 75,000 jobs in, the, in our great state. We sell over 361,000 new vehicles a month, generating over $18 billion in revenue. We also collect a lot of taxes. We collect over $1.7 billion in state and local taxes, $1.3 billion in TAVT taxes, and $70 million in tax and titles. So please join me in visiting with your favorite dealer in your community, in your home on Monday, March 27th from 9 a.m to 1 p.m. So when you drive in, take a look at all those new cars out there and put a down payment on one. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Spoken like a true car salesman. <laughs> I recognize the senator from the Senate from a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to take a moment to also wish everyone a Ramadan Mubarak to my Muslim constituents and to all Muslims in Georgia. Ramadan is a sacred time for Muslims. It is our holiest month and it marks the revelation of the Quran. Ramadan marks a mo month long spiritual journey of fasting and prayer. It is also a month where Muslims practice discipline, sacrifice and charitable giving to those who are struggling. I encourage all of our neighbors, public leaders, and members of the press to learn more about the significance of Ramadan and the rich diversity of the Georgia Muslim community. Georgia's Muslim community contributes immensely to the progress of our state's economy, public health, innovation, and to ensuring we are a robust democracy. I wish you all a blessed holy month of reflection, renewal, charity, and community. I yield the well. Thank you, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 29th, speak for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a few years back, there was a group of us standing here in the Capitol, and they were celebrating uh, sports and championships and things of that nature, and I, I don't get really excited about things like that. Uh, I'm a product of my upbringing and a product of my profession where the joys I find in life aren't necessarily the same things that other people may find. And a good friend of mine who was in that group asked a very serious question to me and they said, Randy, where do you find your joy? And if you were in here earlier, you saw me walk in here with my four-year-old daughter, um, Anderson Naomi Robertson. And I have a 30-year-old daughter that lives in California, and I have a 28-year-old son that lives in Florida. And Andy, who is sitting in my office right now watching this, knows that she is my joy. She is my world famous, and she is my tiny baby. And that is where I find my joy. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 21st. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to excuse the uh, senator from the 27th for business. Without objection, the senator from the 27th is excused. Are there any unanimous consents? You have a consent calendar of privilege resolutions before you. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the calendar? Chair hears none. Resolution on the consent calendar are adopted. Recognize the senator from the no there. Senator from the twenty eighth. Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent that HB 454 be withdrawn from the general calendar and be committed to the Committee on Rules. The Senator has, moved, has asked for unanimous consent that HB 454 be withdrawn from the general calendar and recommitted to rules. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 454 by Representative Blackman of the 146 and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 48 of the Official Code of Georgia annotated relating to revenue and taxation so as to revise the terms Internal Revenue Code and Internal Revenue Code of 1986 and thereby incorporate certain provisions of the federal law into Georgia law to provide for related matters to provide for an effective date and applicability. That completes your Ms. President. Are, is there objection to the uh, motion or to the unanimous consent? Without objection, uh, unanimous consent is granted.
you have before you a consent calendar of local bills. Mr. Secretary, have any objections been filed for any of the local bills on the consent calendar? Mr. President, no objections have been filed. Is there objection to the agreeing to the board of the committee on state and local governmental operations, which is favorable to the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar? Chair hears none, the board of the committee is agreed to. Question is on, is on the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar. All those in favor will vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machines. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 47, the nays are zero. The bills on the local consent calendar have received the requisite constitutional majority and is therefore passed. Okay. Recognize the senator from six. Mr. President, I'd like unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the second. Without objection, senator from the second is excused. Recognize the majority leader for a motion. I recognize the whip for a motion, 29th. Senator from the 29th. Mr. President, I move that HB 572 be engrossed. The Senator Majority Whip has moved that HB 572 be engrossed. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 572 by Representative Reeves and the 99th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 21 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to government transparency and campaign finance so as to rename the Georgia Government Transparency and Campaign Finance Commission at the, as the State Ethics Commission to amend Code Section 3662.5 and 3726.1 and Title 20, 45 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection? There is objection to the motion of engrossment. All those in favor of the motion will vote yay. All those opposed, oh, excuse me. Uh, Senator from the 31st, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse Senator from the 45th. Without objection, the Senator from the 45th is excused. Is excused. The motion is on HB 572 to be engrossed. We have objection from the senator from the 41st. All those in favor, oh, you would like to speak to the motion? Uh, recognize the senator from the 29th to speak. And senator from the 41st, if you want to speak after the 29th, you're welcome to. Colleagues, I think we're all Colleagues, I think we're all familiar with this exercise at this point, that if it is a piece of legislation that comes out of ethics or comes out of finance, it is the custom of this body to engross it. It has been the custom of this body to engross it for years and years and years. And so what I would ask everybody to do is please vote the green button for the engrossment of HB 572. Thank you. I yield the well. 
Senator from 41st, you wave. The motion is on engrossing House Bill 572 from the Senator from the 29th. All those in favor of the motion will vote yay. All those opposed, nay. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the motion, the yeas are 30, the nays are 21, and the motion has prevailed. And HB 572 is engrossed. On to the rules calendar. HB 19. Hold on, before we say it's talk about the rules calendar, I, I do want to make a point that uh, our kickball game for the house the other day, my pitcher, from the 41st back there did an excellent job. I want to congratulate y'all, but I could not believe that after I left, it was nine to three when I left that game, and then all of a sudden I hear about the house winning uh, the kickball game. So um, I know y'all say I cheated, but it really truly indicates that when I leave the room, the wheels really do fall off, you know, so. <laughs> It was fun, and, and uh, everybody played well, and it was a lot of fun. So glad we got to do that. And we'll get them back. We'll get them back. On to the rules calendar. House Bill 19. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 19 by Representative Burns of the 159th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to make and provide appropriations for the state fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023 and ending June 30th, 2024, to make and provide such appropriations for the operation of the state government and its departments, boards, bureaus, commissions, institutions, and other agencies. The Committee of the Senate on Appropriations recommends that this bill do pass by substitute, respectfully submitted by Senator Diller Tillery of the 19th District Chairman. Senate Appropriations Committee substitute to HB 19, a bill to be entitled an act to make and provide appropriations for the state fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023 and ending Jul June 30th, 2024 to make and provide such appropriations for the operation of the state government and its departments, boards, bureaus, commissions, institutions, and other agencies. That completes the order, Mr. President. I recognize our distinguished appropriations chairman, the chairman from the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President. I noticed all of you moved to the edge of your seats. Thank you. Members of this body, I bring to you uh, the Senate Appropriations Substitute to House Bill 19. First, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the folks who got us to this point today. As you know, our Senate Budget Office works nonstop. They're scattered around the room, and I want to recognize them again. Brent, Courtney, Austin, Martha Grace. Lindsay, Mary, Sonny, Caitlin, Carly, Noah, and downstairs Angela and Abby, and today Spencer and Chloe who helped put together some stuff to get ready for today. Y'all know we're missing Caitlin back at home right now of medical emergency earlier this year. If you guys would give them a round of applause even in Caitlin's absence. team you are phenomenal individuals and you are quite a phenomenal collective team and it's a pleasure to work with you in the 
past four years that I've had the opportunity to do so. I also want to thank our friends at OPB, the months that they put into making this bill happen. Before we even got here, Director Farr and his team of staff uh, have listened to our concerns over the past half a decade. And a lot of the changes that you've seen incorporated over the past three years are changes that, that he heard us on and through time was able to work in uh, to the governor's budget from the beginning. Also, Chairman Hatchett, his first year has been phenomenal. His uh, compassion, his openness to ideas from others, he listens so much better than I do. Y'all know that. Y'all probably go to him instead of me. Um, but he is, he is a force in the House already, and I know that our budget will continue to improve with him at the guidance uh, from the helm from the House. I appreciate uh, Speaker Jones at the time and, and Speaker Burns for keeping him there. The FY24 budget proposal before you now is a $32.4 billion budget. It supports law enforcement, as I said, in committee. It protects our families, supports our children, and quite literally, as many of you wrote and asked, gives them hope. In the big picture that I said already, I know it's fair to say that the Senate's version more fairly reflects the governor's budget uh, than, than our comrades across the hall, our compadres across the hall. Comrades, probably not the best word to use, was it there, boys? The Senate's budget in big picture replaces funding that the House pulled from Medicaid. It also replaces re the reinsurance program that was reduced by the House and adds to it. It returns HOPE funding to 100% for students with a B average. That was the second most requested item by the members of this body. And it supports the governor's $2,000 raise for all state employees. Moving into title areas, we'll talk about health. In Medicaid, you know we restored the cuts that were endured across the hall to ABD. We also were able to true up some costs due to FMAP changes uh, through ABD, LIM, and then Peach Care. Our budget also allows for the reimbursement of OATs, occupational therapy assistance, and physical therapy assistance, and provides, uh, allows them for Medicaid members receiving children's interventional services, which also provides parity with our neighboring states. There's a shore up in this budget before you of about a billion dollars to the state health benefit plan. We talked about that a whole lot in the amended budget, but you see it reflected here. And in DHS, we worked with DCH, DHS, and the Office of Health Strategies to begin a plan to address a structural deficit in our child caring institutions, about $60 million, and that allows for those institutions to transition over to a new federal model, which will allow them to be eligible for federal 4E funds in the future. At the Department of Public Health, we matched the House and actually doubled the funding for the Babies Can't Wait program. It's an early intervention program that supports infants and toddlers with special needs. And back over at DHS, we added $5 million to support the ending of hoteling. Go a little off script here for a second. When I spoke the other night, I told you that there were um, at the time, I believe 13 or 14 children who were sitting in ERs across our state waiting for our state contractor to move them out to permanent medical placements where they could get the care and services they need. We know that ERs is not the place that serves them best. Also, it doesn't serve our budget best. As of right now, or as of last night, 68 children were in hoteling situations across our state. That is 68 too many, and we will continue to hammer this point until it's 68 less. We also had 17 children, as of right now, who are bouncing either between an ER, a crisis stabilization unit, or a residential psychiatric treatment facility. We spend $178 million a year, including federal funds, on this contract. And I do not understand why well, that $178 million total contract cannot end this issue. Back on script. The Senate's budget also provides $18 million to provide time to allow child caring institutions to transition over to the qualified residential treatment programs I mentioned to you before. And it adds over $40 million over the governor's budget to address mental health staffing and facility needs at the Department of Behavioral Health. We held the line with the increases that the House proposed for our home and community-based providers. 
And the line item that we were requested to add the most by the Senate members in this budget was that the Senate's version of House Bill 19 will fund 500 now comp waivers. And the credit for this again goes to the senators from the 40th and the senator from the 56 who've championed this cause in a bipartisan fashion and had numerous, numerous uh, members of this body sign on in support of their letters and I appreciate their, their approach and their support. In our budget categories concerning education, I think it's fair to say that we address three things, literacy, dyslexia, and QBE. For the second year in a row, there's no austerity reduction to the QBE formula, and we did fund the $2,000 teacher increase. This budget also made significant progress towards screening all students from kindergarten through third grade for dyslexia by including nearly $5 million for the cost of screening, in addition to other state funding for dyslexia coordinators and a dyslexia endorsement for teachers, which is already in the base budget at $1.63 million. We passed that bill several years ago, Senate Bill 48. It was set to come online in FY 2025. And this budget actually brings that dyslexia screening online one year early, funds it one year early. And thank you for the uh, support from the members of the subcommittee and the other members of this body on that endeavor. We also were able to take Senate Bill 211, uh, championed by the Senator from the 4th, and you've heard his comments on literacy in this chamber many, many times over the past two years. And we took and made it more than just a council and a commission. We were able to stand it up by moving roughly $1 million behind it to support its initiatives to help with early reading, to address our third grade reading levels, which you've heard the Senator from the 4th talk about, lie below 50% for on grade level. At higher education, the Senate's budget returns to the governor's position by funding 100% factor rate for prior year tuition for the HOPE grants and the HOPE scholarships at public schools. It also adds another nickel to move the public library materials grants to 70 cents per capita for a total of $7.7 .7 million. And it provides additional funds for TCSG to recognize the high cost of delivering CDL and nursing courses, which are also both high in demand. Last year we were able to fund the aviation portion of this. This year we were able to come back on nursing and CDL programs. The Senate's budget also supports conservative budgeting by requesting that our Board of Regents utilize carry forward funds to support the teaching formula and conserve valuable state dollars at a time that I've told you where the clouds on the horizon are beginning to look a little darker. We expect continued discussion with the Governor's Office and with the House Consider, concerning building funds, bond funds, and a, a robust discussion I'm sure will include, will continue concerning how we fund planning dollars, building dollars, and FF&E that follows after the buildings are built. In the area of public safety, our, the Senate's proposal supports technological and data management upgrades at our courts. It also supports a $6,000 increase for state troopers, Capitol Police, DNR Rangers, and the GBI. The way we funded this was actually by reducing funds for the trooper school. Trooper schools are typically funded each year for about $11 million. We cut that in half, used those excess funds to move to those state police who have had, as you know, increased duties over the past two years. Our thought was there is a learning curve as people exit trooper school and these other training schools. And if we can, can, if we can hang on and keep our, our already trained staff that that's actually a cost savings long term uh, and better uh, services provided for our citizens. We funded the cold case unit at the GBI and the senator from the 26th would not let me get out of this podium without telling you that we funded bonds to improve the GBI crime lab in Macon as well as various scientist positions at that GBI crime lab to answer the call of those below I-20 for why they're having to travel so far for certain services and wait for death certificates and other things. The Senator from the 26th has been a champion on this issue. The department has heard him. We have heard him. And we are really, really thankful for a director register and the answers that he's already bringing to the table, thanks to the Senator from the 26th. Our state budget funded other things as well. I want to run through them really quickly. The statewide independent living council had a wait list of about 700 people. By moving funds in other areas of the budget, we were able to wipe out that wait list. 
We're also able to start a program that improves natural gas access in rural communities, acknowledging the success that the governor's office and the members of this body have had with broadband. For years we were told broadband, broadband, broadband. We had to deliver broadband everywhere. Well, guys, you've almost done it. But now we see that when one mountain is crossed, there lies another mountain ahead. And I think the next mountain ahead of us from a utility standpoint is going to prove to be natural gas. So the Senate's put down its marker to begin a program to help expand capacity in rural areas. And we look forward to working with the, our partners in the governor's office and across the hall to see where we can end on that in conference. The Senate's budget also supports our growing EV industry by transitioning certain unfilled positions at certain regional projects to other regional projects in southeast Georgia. And it also funds the Ag Department's request for increased funds to enforce sole amendment rules across our states. The Senate budget, as I already told you, funds the coal increase for game wardens at $6,000. And it funds support in Ag for positions in blueberry, citrus, and the peach industry. The Senate budget also makes a continued commitment to reduce state liabilities by committing $5 million to reduce the state workers' compensation liabilities. We were able to do that a few years ago at a six-figure number. We were able to drive that number down and save years in, in outstanding liabilities. The $5 million, again, is just a marker to continue that program after the extreme success of our folks at DOAS under Director Sullivan and Wade Dameron. The Senate budget also agrees with the House to provide a one-time benefit adjustment of $26.75 million in total, or roughly $500 individual for all state eligible retirees. And it also recognizes that ERS COLAs are now being pre-funded through employer contributions as we move forward. The Senate budget increases funds for the Georgia Food Bank program, and it recognizes $11 million in transit projects outside of Atlanta with a novel idea championed by Commissioner McMurray to basically make sure we're not doubling back over our own certain rides uh, and helping citizens get to the services uh, and appointments that they need to. The Senate also funded various bonds. I see you've already turned there, most of you have, uh, in USG projects. We're going to have a longer discussion about planning dollars. I look forward to having that with you and others and our colleagues in the House. But it does provide roughly $600 million in bonding capacity uh, for the future years. I've already told you that, you know, we don't get to create dollars, so where do we get those funds? Well, that, that's part of your budget as well. We didn't agree with some of the House ads. There were FMAP changes that I mentioned earlier that our staff was able to develop. And by the Senate going last, we get the best, the last crack at seeing what the FMAP changes are going to be. We were able to true up the dollars of certain unhired positions and unfilled positions. And then there was, as I mentioned already, conservative budgeting uh, aimed and targeted at our largest agencies uh, with directions to use other funds, whether those be carry forward funds, air agency surpluses, or other retained revenue. We held the house reduction at airport aid and we provided the same percentage reduction at rail aid. We pulled funds committed to the criminal data exchange program and we're going to move those to the new program. I think the uh, senator from the 18th has a bill on that that we expect to see shortly. What we've seen in this chamber, we'll see from the House shortly. We also reduced uh, certain funds at other program expenditure areas like the Georgia Coordinating Center, the Georgia Cyber Center, and the Georgia Public Television. We reduced our testing budget and some people have asked, why did we do that? Well, this body for years has maintained its commitment to reduce the testing requirement on our students and on our teachers in the classroom. And if we're going to reduce that testing requirement, we believe the budget should follow that reduction in tests, and this budget reflects that. I've heard a lot of reports about headlines lately. I actually brought the paper to read. This one doesn't get delivered to my district, so I have to pick it up when I'm here. And I saw lines that say we're in a budget fight, that this building's about to burn down. They don't know if we'll make it to Sunny Die. Well, guys, I want to tell you, for the past 200 years, we've made it to Sunny Die, and there's been no problem. And the rhetoric in the halls isn't always the truth. You see, I asked our staff today, with me, to count up the lines of this budget. There are 1,412 lines 
in HB 19. Of those lines, 743, 52.6% have already been agreed upon by the House, the Senate, and the governor. 52.6%. If you take and look at just where two of the bodies agree, just the House and the Senate, 1,176 lines where we already agree. That's 83.29%. You see, folks in this building will try to stir you up sometimes and get you worried. I want to remind you, they're getting you worried about 236 lines. 236 lines out of 1,412. Members of this body, what you've done over the past 38 days is incredible. You focused on your districts, you focused on your constituents, you focused on your families and what you want for your future. And I don't think we're gonna have a problem with the building burning down or us making it to day 40. So Mr. President, with that, thank you again for allowing me to present this bill on behalf of the Senate. I'll take any questions, and if there are no questions, I'll yield the will. And you and your team have done a great job, Senator. You do have a few questions. Uh, Senator from the 14th. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, uh, Senator Yield. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, just to go ahead and begin by echoing the great respect and appreciation uh, that I, I know many of my colleagues have for your role and the role of the staff in putting together uh, such a comprehensive document, working hard on this. Um, I want to raise an issue I think has been covered a little bit by media already, which is a 25% cut to Georgia Public Broadcasting. Obviously, yeah. on its face, there are many members of the public who would have a concern about something like that. I mean, the importance of public education via TV and radio uh, can't be understated. And so I just wanted to at least raise that question for you, Mr. Chairman, today uh, to see if you could uh, address the record on why uh, the Senate version of the budget includes that cut. Well, thank you, Senator. Yeah, happy to do so. It's actually 26 percent. But that's uh, thank you for that number. Uh, it takes the funding level from 14 million to roughly 10 million, I believe. If uh, the reason behind it, if they look, if folks have questions in the media about it, they can look back at the FY21 budget. They'll say this is not the first time this has been addressed. Over the years, other stations who are, I guess, would be viewed as competitors in the same space as GPB have brought a very valid argument to our body. And they've said, hey, why are you funding one and not the other? Let's be honest, what they're really saying is, why are you funding my competition? But I think that's actually a very valid point. Well, why are we picking winners and losers? I don't think that's what the space we want to be in. So the dollar value, it was reduced, I believe, in the FY21 budget one time already. We were able to come back and work things out. There's not a hatred of GPB in this building. If you look back at our amended budget, there's a $600,000 ad for lighting for their studios. I think you'll also see in this budget there's a bond ad for radio towers and other equipment necessary. I think the GPB education budget, if you look at our audits that were performed, I believe last in FY, uh, be FY20, because it was 2019, 2020, Chairman Hill argued or pushed for that audit last, where the education program uh, was a hit uh, and it scored off the charts where the content it was being able to provide, and I know it was multiplied during the pandemic. So that, we would love for the continued focus on uh, educational programming. I, I think they have, uh, maybe some of the competitors have struck a chord with members of this body and others who brought up the fact that why are we picking winners and losers and we don't, we don't want to be in that market and right now that argument is winning, winning the day at least in this body. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I will just correct the record. I think I said understated. I meant to say overstated earlier, but that's the only thing I'll say. Uh, thanks for your response. Yes, sir. Recognize the Senator from the first for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Yeo. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. That certainly is a uh, fabulous budget. A lot of work has been done. You know, I noticed that, uh, you know, the Senate uh, fully funded 100% of HOPE scholarship. Uh, but to me, the real discussion is that the section of the budget of DCH or Medicaid, that the House had reduced it by about $100 million. Uh, and the Senate reversed that and asked the Board of Regents to carry forward the funds uh, by $100 million. Uh, isn't that the sort of the real discussion for that three-legged stool you sort of like to talk about at times? I think that's a very fair way of putting it. Yes, sir, the House had a hit to Medicaid of about uh, 110 million, roughly. We were able to put that back. Um, they, uh, we were able, we pulled some money out of Medicaid as well, but it was FMAP savings, which is a, a truer cut. It's a, it's a, it's a real cut. Um, 
and matches with federal dollars and what federal funding is going to be set be set at. So I do think it's probably fair to say yes. If that was their one hundred million dollar move, then ours was probably on Regents. We did put back the hundred million at, at healthcare. Yes, sir. Recognize the senator from the twenty seventh. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chairman, do you yield? Yes, sir. I want to echo the thanks that you've heard. I want to follow up on the senator from the first question. He was referencing hundred million dollars of add back to um, the health side of the equation. It looks like a, a decent chunk of that, maybe even all of that though was removed from the university system. Can you help us understand that and, and maybe the how and the why? Uh, sure. I, I'll walk you through the first, the, where it came from. Uh, roughly 18 million was a health insurance ad at the university budget. Um, we were not consulted on that. I wish we would have. I'm sure we will be in the future. Uh, but when we weren't, weren't consulted on that ad or that move, uh, that really made low-hanging fruit, if you want to be honest. Uh, probably want to go talk to the people with the money before you make that change. Uh, but the, the others would have been roughly 88 million out of the teaching formula. The reason being is, as you knew, we wanted to add back the funds that were pulled at Medicaid. And uh, to do so, you, you, you got to find those funds. Well, the Board of Regents has to give, because of the former senator from the 37th, uh, Chairman Tippins, a carry forward report each year. It's actually on the handout that does the summary on page three of that summary uh, notes that I see the chairman from the 15th holding right now. Page three is the summary page of those carry forward funds. They're broken down in a full report. I'll show you the full report. I brought it up here with me just in case I got this question. It's, it's the legislative carry forward report from October of 2022. Breaks down the carry forward funds for each agency. Now remember, there are very few agencies that are allowed to carry forward funds and can't do so without asking OPB normally. The legislature does not carry forward funds. If we don't spend our $6,000 allowance per member, it returns back to the state treasury. Uh, if DCH doesn't, they have to ask permission from OPB. If uh, you know, other agencies that don't have guaranteed funds, that those are returned. And the university system does get a, a, an ability to hold carry forward funds. Those last year totaled on page We'll see here, I think it's three or four of the report, five of the report, it's the third page in your summary, $504 million. So we thought if we have to figure out where those monies should be pulled to reimburse Medicaid, that it made sense to pull 20% only of the carry forward funds uh, to do so. Can I follow up on that just one more? Absolutely. I've heard some comment in the halls that the small schools may be disproportionately impacted. And I want to say that that is not necessarily the facts. If you look at the Georgia Constitution, Article 8, Section 4, Paragraph 1, Subsection C, says directly that the Board of Regents shall decide how their funds are allocated. We block grant over $3 billion to the Board of Regents. So if you're hearing from a small school, one of your smaller schools, that, hey, we're going to be disproportionately impacted, those bigger schools like Georgia Southern and UGA and Georgia Tech, they can handle this carry forward hit. We can't. They don't have to. You see, Article 8, Section 4, Paragraph 1, Subsection C says the ability to allocate those funds once they are blocked, grant over to the Board of Regents, well, that lies with the Board of Regents. So if they wish to take these dollars moves and make them less impactful for, southern, for smaller colleges, they have the full authority, not just by law, but by the Georgia Constitution to do so. So I do reject the notion that this should have a disparate impact on smaller schools. Senator recognizes, uh, recognize the Senator from 53rd. Hey, Mr. President, does the Senator yield? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, there's no doubt you've got a lot of weight on your shoulders and what you do, and, and I don't envy you one bit. Um, I think you and I, though, would both agree that, that public safety is one of the first and foremost proper roles of government. And uh, it's come to my understanding, and I'd just like some clarification on it, that, that motor carrier compliance isn't getting the same raise uh, that the GBI and the, and the troopers and everyone else is. Now that's very important to the people of the Northwest because Interstate 75 is the most truck trafficked interstate in our state. 
And Ringgold, we have a way station there, and I think the people of the Northwest uh, expect that if we give good pay to officers, we can expect good officers to do the work. So could you clarify why they weren't included in the raise? Sure. I think you have Interstate 59 as well, am I correct, Senator? And 59? Interstate 24 as well. Okay. The, uh, yeah, when we were moving the trooper school monies to figure out how we would allocate um, increased raises, we were not trying to say anyone's better than others. That was not our goal. Uh, what we were looking to do is to um, compensate those who have had increased duties. Uh, I think there's a valid argument that the MCCD division has had that. What we focused on mostly were those who were having to respond to uh, riots and chaos during the pandemic. And I uh, look forward to talking with you more offline and in conference about um, if there are others we left out, it was not intentional. But for the members of this body and those listening, for where we focused and why, uh, that is why we focused where we did. You have another further question, Senator? Thank you, Mr. President. Members of this body, thank you again for allowing me to present this budget. And uh, thank you all for your indulgence today. I hope you can vote in favor of the uh, committee substitute. Thank you a lot. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. On the, on the adoption, without objection, on the adoption of the committee substitute, Secretary will unlock, unlock the machine. Excuse me. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are 1. This bill, having received the rest of the constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. Good job, Senator, from the 19th and your staff. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Senator from the 19th, you request to speak. Uh, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. President. State your inquiry. I request that the House Bill 19 be immediately transmitted to the House. It's automatic today, Senator. Thank you. But great job, good job, good, good work with your uh, staff there, and of course we're work's not done yet, but y'all, y'all uh, lift made a heavy lift uh, up to this point. So thank you for your hard work. Moving on to the rules calendar, HB 76. Secretary, read the, read the caption. House Bill 76 by Representative Powell the 33rd and others a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 10A of Title 43 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated. Relating to licensing provisions regarding professional counselors, social workers, and marriage and family therapists so as to revise provisions relating to education, experience, and training requirements for licensure and marriage and family therapy. The Committee of the Senate on Children and Families recommends that this bill do pass by substitute respectively submitted by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd District Chairman. Senator Brass of the 28th offers the following amendment, amend the Senate Committee Substitute on Children and Families to amend the Senate, Senate Committee on Children and Families Substitute to House Bill 76 by adding after review on line four the following to provide for the regulation of bare knuckle boxing matches, to provide for definitions to authorize the commission to promulgate rules and regulations. Senate Children's and Families offers the following substitute to House Bill 76, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Titles 43 and 45 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to professions and businesses and public officers and employees respectfully, so as to change provisions relating to certain occupations and appointments. <coughs> Senate 
Senators Tillery of the 19th and Brass of the 28th offer the following amendment, Amendment 2, to amend the Senate com Committee substitute to House Bill 76 by striking line 129 and inserting therein and after nothing in this bill shall add any additional requirements or restrictions to clinical pastoral counselors. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 28th. Thank you, Mr. President. I bring to y'all HB 76 and the underlying bills as it arrived from the House. Uh, it simply just revises the licensure qualifications for marriage and family therapists and brings them into uh, national standards. Now, once the bill arrived in committee, we, uh, we offered a couple of, of amendments, or I'm sorry, we offered a substitute. And in that substitute, I will go over the, the additions very briefly, but uh, one thing we did was uh, if, if the governor or someone is removed from a, uh, a board or whatever that is appointed by the governor, there was no mechanism for the governor to reappoint that person um, you know, so they would have to wait till that term was up. So that vac that vacancy would remain vacant until uh, till they got till the term ended. And so we added language that simply allows the governor to do that. And you can uh, see that in uh, where is that? Anyway, it's in the bill. And uh, lines 120. I'm sorry. Uh, lines 120 through 123. And also, I all offered a uh, in, as part of the substitute we also everyone's familiar with the Georgia occupational review council or whatever you call it um, and we've had issues with gork as we call it uh, we've had issues with we don't know if the chicken or the egg comes first do we introduce a bill and then it goes to gork or um, or does it go to Gork and then we introduce the bill and it's very unclear and more importantly it really usurps the legislative process and uh, so we've with with the issues we've had through the years on licensing and uh, I'm returning uh, this power this wisdom back to the legislature because I think y'all are the the smartest and the brightest in this state and um, I say that very unbiasedly. And so we are simply going to get rid of Gork. And you can kiss it goodbye. So I would love your support on that. And then we've got a couple of amendments that I'll speak to. Uh, amendment one, which I offered uh, along with the great senator from the 50th. Uh, this is simply an industry that really is there's so few people uh, that partake in bare knuckle boxing uh, and as we all know we're very limited in our time here as far as the committee process and so um, so I thought that I would just bring this to the committee of the whole and let us make a decision on this because this as a standalone bill would never um, probably wouldn't see the light of day in committee uh, nor make it to rules and never make it to the floor. So this is really about the only way we can do it. And so simply all we're trying to do is, is, is the, for the very few people that have bare knuckle boxing matches is really just trying to make sure that it's done in a safe way and, then it's, and we're giving the authority to the boxing commission um, to, to regulate this and make sure it's done safely. Um, so I know the senator from the 14th has great passion for this. Um, there is a little irony here that we're having bare knuckle boxing on with uh, marriage licenses, but um, but it is uh, it is in the same code section, and so it is germane, and in some cases is very germane, unfortunately. Now, to on to Amendment Two, offered by the Senator from the 19th, I'll just speak to that briefly. Um, the uh, he had concerns with me about the underlying bill and and. and potential restrictions that may be put on clinical pastoral counselors. So we just wanted to make sure that was very clear that that is not the intent of this bill. 
And I am authorized to say by the House author, Chairman Powell, um, said that he has vast knowledge and experience with marriage counselors, uh, but he has very little knowledge and experience with pastoral counselors. Uh, and so I didn't want to add that, but, uh, but overall, I, I support both amendments and encourage your favorable consideration of this fine piece of legislation. With that, I'll yield for questions. You do have a couple questions, Senator. I uh, figured. Senator from the 27th. Thank you, Mr. President. Chairman Yield. Uh, of course. I wasn't quite able to hear over here because Senator from the 31st was, was uh, talking during your presentation, but did you say that you're delivering a knockout blow to Gork? Uh, Senator, I think that would be accurate, uh, and since the uh, since we're not we haven't regulated it yet, I'm able to do that without any without it being. Well, I know how you love to regulate things, but I appreciate the effort to uh, deliver this bare knuckle knockout blow to Gork. Well, me being a, uh, I kind of like things equal, so I feel like if we're going to create some government through licensing and commissioning of bare knuckle boxing I thought it only fair to balance it out and get rid of a, another government agency balance is key moderation senator from the 23rd encourage thank you mr. president senator yield I yield I, I, I want you to know I, I fully support the knockout blow to Gort my question is a point of order is amendment one germane to the underlying bill well, if you're asking me, my answer is yes, but I think I, I that would, question should be directed to the uh, I would, I would lieutenant ask, governor. I would ask the president of the Senate to make a decision on the, the germaneness of Same code section. Amendment 1 to the underlying bill. I will take that under consideration, Senator, and uh, but we're going to let these other people get finished with their questions, and, and uh, then I'll... I'll look, I'll look at the amendments there, but thank you. Senator from the 14th, are you, you want to speak to it? Senator from the 56. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? I do yield for my good friend from Roswell. The most powerful rules chairman. Uh, the home of Gork. I understand you have uh, an ongoing battle with Gork. Is that not true? Um, it was true until today. Would you say you're taking the gloves off now? They've been off, baby. <laughs> Go get them. But I'll add, you know, we're not, we're not doing sanctioned brass knuckle events, only bare knuckle events. Senator, you, got, you have a history of boxing, don't you? Don't I remember you being a part of a boxing club at the that University is accurate it was not bare knuckle I had gloves in both instances and uh, I retired at a career record of 01 and 1 I remember you won an only fight senator it was uh, it wasn't pretty but uh, you, well that was my a, one that was a well I'm not sure which one you were at <laughs> you have no questions neither one of them were pretty in my mind <laughs> thank you I yield I don't believe I don't believe there's any danger any golden gloves being given out there after that one. So I recognize Senator from the fourteenth. Thank you, Mr. President, and you know, like the uh, Senator from the twenty eighth, I know what y'all think when you look at me. I can see it in your faces. You look at me, you think, now that's a guy who can handle himself in a bare knuckle fist fight. Uh, in all seriousness, since we are submitting this to the Committee of the Whole today, I just want to give you a couple quick facts about the bare knuckle boxing industry. Believe it or not, it is actually safer than boxing with gloves. Uh, over the last few decades, there have been studies that show that adding the mass with a glove and the fact that you feel more unrestrained, quite candidly, uh, leads to greater numbers of concussions and hand injuries than the bare knuckle version of the sport. And so, yeah, you, you tie a little, uh, you know, tape around your fists, and that might cause a slight increase in cuts, is what studies show. Uh, but that's not nearly as bad as the concussions and the hand injuries that result from more traditional forms of boxing. So it's a safer version of the sport. An important limitation that's in this amendment uh, is that in lines 
32 and 33, it says only an individual who has qualifying experience can participate, and that's defined further up as somebody who essentially is a professional already in one of the other fighting sports. Uh, so this is a, to the, the Senator's point, a very limited uh, amendment that would just allow a handful of people to participate. But with that limited amendment, we would be able to take advantage of the, the fast-growing nature of the sport uh, and be able to generate revenues uh, through, you know, pay-per-view and other events. So uh, I rise today in full support of Amendment 1, you know, leave the procedural elements uh, to the body and to the President, uh, but this is good policy and I think it would be good for the state of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against measure? I, I did take it under careful consideration, Senator, and I do believe that it, this is germane to the bill. So that being said, is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. The question is now on the amendments. Oh. Senator from the 19th, I apologize. It, we had you would, would you like to speak on your amendment? You're good? Okay. I think the author of the of the bill is in favor of your amendment. So Question on Amendment 1, offered by the Senator from the 28th. Is there objection to Amendment 1? There is objection. All those in favor of Amendment 1 will vote yay. All those opposed, nay. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the adoption of the amendment, the yeas are 46 and the nays are 4, and this amendment has been adopted. On amendment number 2, authored by the senator from the 19th, is there objection to the adoption of amendment number 2? Without objection, amendment number 2 is adopted. The question is on the adoption of the committee substitute as amended. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute as amended? Hearing none, the committee substitute is, as amended is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill. By substitute, all those in favor will vote yay, opposed nay, Secretary Lawton Machine.
On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 48 and the nays are 1. This bill having received the excellent constitutional majority is therefore passed by substitute. Now we move on to HB 243. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 243 by Representative Smith of the 70th and others, a bill to be dialed an act to amend Code Section 15.62 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to the number of judges of Superior Courts so as to provide for an eighth judge of the Superior Courts of Coweta Judicial Cir Circuit. The Committee of the Senate on Judiciary recommends that this bill do pass by substitute, respectfully submitted by Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. Judiciary offers the following substitute to House Bill 243, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 15.62 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to the number of judges of Superior Courts so as to provide for an eighth judge of the Superior Courts of the Coweta Judi Judicial Circuit, to provide for the appointment of such additional judge by the Governor, to provide for the elections of successors to the judge initially appointed. That completes the order, Mr. President. Bring it as the Senator from the 28th. Thank you, Mr. President. As a proud citizen of the Coweta Circuit of Georgia, um, we are the second largest or second heaviest caseload of all circuits within the entire state. And so we are simply asking to add one more judge to our circuit uh, to lighten the load for, so that we can begin to process more cases. That's all this bill does. I'll yield for questions. You uh, have no questions, Senator. Thank you. I urge your favorable consideration on House Bill 243. I yield the will. Does any other senator, senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to the agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Question is on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor vote yay, all those opposed nay. Secretary unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 50 and the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. <laughs> Moving on to HB 87, House Bill 87. Secretary, read the caption. House Bill 87 by Representative Irwin of the 32nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 20 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to elementary and secondary education so as to revise and repeal certain provisions for alternative charter schools to provide for the continued operation of state charter special schools until no longer than the expiration of each such school's current charter with the State Board of Education. The Committee of the Senate on Education and Youth recommends that this bill do pass by substitute, respectfully submitted by Senator Dixon of the 45th District Chairman. The Committee on Education and Youth offers the following substitute to House Bill 87, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 20 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to elementary and secondary education so as to revise and repeal certain provisions for alternative charter schools to provide for the continued operation of 
state chartered special schools until no later than the expiration of each such school's current charter with the State Board of Education. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the senator from the 32nd to speak to the bill. Or uh, senator from the 50th to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Today I rise to bring you House Bill 87, also known as the Non-Traditional Special Schools Act. Um, the, uh, this bill began two, two years ago when this body passed out Senate Bill 153, which in essence uh, was going to close the doors of three charter schools in the state of Georgia, Mountain Education, Foothills, and coastal plains. In response to their pending closure, a study committee was formed, hundreds of hours were put in, uh, a lot of work was done by um, our friends across the hall, interested parties across the state, and ultimately we've arrived here with House Bill 87, which will allow these schools to continue to operate. House Bill 87 establishes completion schools these give children uh, additional options to, to get their degree. Children who can't go to school during the traditional eight to three hours uh, because of maybe having to help their family out um, to, and, and going to work, uh, this allows them to have an option to continue to get their high school degree. Um, this will help with workforce development in the state. This will help with uh, families in the state and it also uh, one of the, the good consequences of this is it will help uh, our military as some of you may know in order to join the military you have to have a high school degree but these schools are essential they're essential um, in our communities and quite frankly I believe they're they're essential in making sure Georgia remains the number one state in the nation to do business uh, some questions that I've received Throughout this process uh, that I think it would be important to take back to your district is number one, school or students that are currently enrolled in these schools will be grandfathered in. Nothing will change. Uh, moving forward, 18-year-olds uh, who are considered dropouts will be allowed to enroll in these, um, in these schools and will have four years to complete their degrees. Uh, those who are not dropouts, those who are either at risk of dropping out, behind on credits, or who just need a non-traditional plan will be allowed to enroll. I have, you know, two of these schools operate in my district. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've had the honor and privilege to attend one graduation that actually took place at Lee Arendelle State Prison. And I got to go inside the prison and watch the graduation happen. And to hear the testimonies of the students that were graduating along with alumni that came back to speak and the success stories that these schools have had for these children who otherwise would not have received their high school uh, diploma. It is inspiring. Um, and I, I just, I can't ask you enough to please vote in favor of this piece of legislation because thousands of children have benefited from these schools. And what we are doing with this bill not only will keep the three schools alive today, but moving forward, we are setting a course for more schools like it to open. And so with that, Mr. President, I ask for favorable consideration. We'll be happy to yield for questions. Yeah, you, have, you do have one question. Senator from the fourth, you have a question? Senator, you yield? I do. Yes, sir. Um, is it true that over 6,000 students attend these three different uh, schools in the state? Yes, sir, over, over 6,000 students. And is it also true that there's 6,000 students were dropouts and would probably would have ended up in jail, probably ended up on the street selling drugs, probably ended up teenage pregnancies and all, and that's not happening now? That's correct. Is it also true that these students have the willpower and the want to go to school from 6 o'clock at night to 10 o'clock at night because they're working during the daytime? You know, Senator, I, I think the motivation that I've seen from the, this, these schools, their students, their alumni, 
the number of handwritten letters that I received over the past year is incredible, and I would have to say that you, the senator knows of what he speaks. Would, would you also agree that in this bill, uh, because of the passion that the senator from the 12th has about her area, there will also be this same type of schools that will be created down in southwest Georgia to help out the students in that area? That is correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator from the 32nd. Thank you. Would the senator yield? Yes, I will. Isn't it true that one of the three schools is in my district in Cherokee County and that it's very important to our school district that we pass this bill? I couldn't agree more. Senator, you have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for favorable consideration and will yield the will. Thank you. Recognize Senator from the 45th. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise as well in support of this bill. It passed out of our committee unanimously. Uh, grateful to our partners in the House working with them. Uh, we did make three changes in the Senate and just wanted to go over those with you all real quickly. Uh, but this, these schools, the three schools, Mountain Ed, Foothills, and Coastal Plain, are, they are vitally important uh, for the students that attend there. No matter how they got there, um, you know, if they fell behind in school or wh whatever it was where they couldn't complete school, uh, during the regular school hours, this gives them an option to go at night, whether they've got a job or whatever the circumstance is. So it's massively important that we keep these schools open and keep these options open for these children. The three changes real quickly, uh, we added in, uh, working with, with the house, we added in grandfathering uh, current students that were enrolled, uh, which affects my county and some of the other counties. Uh, we're in Gwinnett, we're in the Metro Atlanta RESA, but the students uh, that ser are served are served by Foothills, which is in Barrow County, which is only about a 20 minute, 30 minute drive for most Gwinnesians. Uh, but the grandfathering lets a, a, a 111 students continue to, to be able to go to that school. And th there's other examples I could give you throughout the state. Um, it also, one other change we made was uh, the Youth Challenge Academies. There's two of those currently. Looks like there may be more added. Uh, we want to make sure those schools stayed open and uh, continue to serve those students as well. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the last one was contiguous counties. If they were in different RESAs and they were contiguous to each other, that those students could go there and they wouldn't miss out on those opportunities. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, President, I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor, of the passage of the bill by substitute vote yay. All those opposed nay. Secretary will not lock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 53 and the nays are zero. This bill having received the rest of the Constitutional majority is therefore passed by substitute. Good job, Senator, from the 50th. I will tell you, there was a lot of work done on this bill behind the scenes from both the House and the Senate, from the Senator from the 45th. 
uh, as well as uh, Senator from the 4th and uh, the 27th and the Majority Leader. Uh, this bill probably got as much work as any, uh, any bill down here trying to help uh, make sure we were taking care of these charter school systems that do a lot of good work. And I just want to thank each and every one of y'all for the hard work that you did. They won't write it in the newspapers, but, uh, but it was a lot of good work and a lot of good kids uh, were benefited from it. So thank y'all very much. Give yourself a round of applause. So. Recognizing the HB 189, Secretary will read the caption. House Bill 189 by Representative Meeks of the 178th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 6 of Title 32 of the Official Code of George Annotated. Relating to dimensions and weight of vehicles and loads so as to provide for an allowable variance of weight for weight limitations upon a vehicle or a load. The Committee of the Senate on Transportation recommends that this bill do pass by substitute, respectfully submitted by Senator Dolezal, the 27th District Chairman. Transportation offers the following substitute to House Bill 189, a bill to be entitled an act to amend to Article 2 of Chapter 6 of Title 32 of the Official Code of George Annotated relating to dimensions and weight of vehicles and loads, so as to provide for an allowable variance for weight limitations upon a vehicle or load hauling certain commodities within a certain range in areas of the state. That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize the uh, Agricultural Chairman, fine senator from the 8th District. Thank you, Mr. President. Three years in and four sessions in, I still get nervous every time I stand up here. But uh, <laughs> colleagues, I rise uh, to encourage my Senate colleagues from all over Georgia, not just rural Georgia, to support HB 189, the truck weights bill, in the form of a Senate Transportation Committee substitute. I want to thank the chairman of the committee and the senator from the 51st for their work on this bill over the last several weeks to include several committee hearings. Georgia's number one industry, agriculture, has benefited for the last three years under our governor's executive order by allowing trucks to haul weights up to 95,000 pounds. With the governor's executive order just recently expiring, this bill would extend similar policy until July the 1st, 2024, by increasing the allowable weight from 84,000 pounds to 88,000 pounds for agricultural and forestry products. While this bill has a one-year sunset and is a 7,000-pound decrease from the allowable weight in the governor's previous executive order, it will prevent further disruption in our supply chain during a time of compounding inflation. Specifically, the bill is limited, say again, it's limited to agriculture and forestry. It allows for a 10% variance. It restricts miles traveled from the point of origin to its destination to, 75, to a 75 mile radius. It grants local law enforcement the ability to weigh trucks if they have reasonable cause and scales. This is important to my uh, metro friends. It restricts trucks from entering the non-attainment area, which is the greater metro Atlanta area. You all know I have a great passion for rural Georgia I consider this bill to be a lifeline for the people that I represent that supply the food and fiber to all of our constituents. It's worth remembering that 1.8% of this country farms, but the other 98.2% that don't, their life depends on the 1.8% that does. Without our number one industry, we are no longer Georgia. In closing, I would remind my colleagues that all of our neighboring states have a variance of either 88 or 90,000 pounds. Vote green, just like John Deere. Let's keep Georgia growing in the right direction. With that, Mr. President, I'll be happy to yield for questions, or I'll yield the well. You do have some questions, Senator. Senator from the 14th. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Yield? Yes, sir. Senator, is it not true at the beginning of this session I started out as a no on this bill? And we ran each other, into each other in the hallway over and over again, and I was no, no, no. And then I put on my great American cobbler hat, and I thought about it. And I got the yes. Is that not true? That is true, Senator. And you look good in that hat as well. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. I recognize the Senator from the 47th. Oh, you won't speak in the front? Okay. You have no further questions, Senator. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. I urge your favorable consideration. Thank you, colleagues. I recognize the Senator from the 47th to speak to the bill.
colleagues, this puts me in a really tough situation. I, I've got a, oh, actually by birth, I have three brothers, but I have two more that are here in the, the chamber with me that are fraternity brothers. And I think both of them want to see this bill pass. But you know, I'm going to tell you, he said, hey, uh, yes, I'm a recovering uh, chair of transportation committee, and I, I appreciate the senator from the 27th. He's, he's worked hard to, to try to navigate where we're at on this piece of legislation. I sat down with the Georgia Forestry Association when, when our, our new ag commissioner introduced a bill to go to 100,000 pound trucks. And I said, guys, I want to help you get competitive. I want to help you raise the weight on trucks. I want to go to the 10% the variance. But there's a cost of doing that. And there's something that we need to take into consideration. And I want you to think about what I proposed to them and what it could mean for Georgia. You know, uh, a lot of people talk about Forrest Gump and his sayings about stupid. Well, my goal is to stop stupid. Down on my desk downstairs in, in my office here at the Capitol, I've got a citation for a truck that went across the scales at 130,100 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, that truck was legally able to carry 80,000 pounds, meaning that that truck was grotesquely overweight. I think y'all can do the math. But more importantly for me, I think that that's the kind of thing that, that will kill people. The truck becomes top heavy, had a load of logs on it. There's no way to say it. That's the truck that will, will break down bridges and tear apart roads. And for me, passing this legislation, it's, it's not good for Georgia. It's not good for our citizens. I'm going to vote no on this bill, but I want to try to come back next year because this is a one-year bill. The, if it does pass, which I hope it does not, I want to help our forestry friends and our ag friends to do something that's more permanent. But here's what I want you to think about. And as I look around at some of our past chairmen of our Transportation Committee, this is where it's important that we work together to improve Georgia. Putting grotesquely overweight trucks on the road is dangerous for all of us. Not only does it destroy our road system, but it kills people. When Senator Harper, and I can say his name because he's not in the Senate anymore, introduced a bill to go to 100,000 pound trucks, within two weeks of that, eight miles from my house, I had a log truck coming around the corner on a state highway that tipped over into the front end of a pickup truck top heavy truck going around a curve and he killed the pickup truck passenger said they and driver and for me this is where I look at what we need to do is we've got to stop stupid now when you look at these truck weights that are listed in here my suggestion was okay our partners and our and the people that we want to help the most are our friends in forestry and ag those crops that they're being grown whether it be ag or forestry are going to a location that gets weighed I've asked our forestry friends and, and ag components, I said, look guys, if it comes across your scales at 95,000 pounds or above, I want to automatically have access for the state of Georgia to take those scales and issue a citation to that uh, trucker right then the, uh, that the, the people that are gonna relinquish those funds are those buyers of those products. So they know right up front, we're gonna stop stupid and we mean it. For this, they, uh, I, I, I really troubled to have my brothers that want to pass this bill they, uh, that are working hard and, and to do the things that we need to do to keep Georgia competitive with our surrounding states. But what we have to do today is we've got to stop stupid. This bill, passing it, is, is what I call stupid. And so I'll ask you to vote no. I, I hate it that it's this way. If it does pass, I want to make sure that everybody in here understands Next year, when we take this up, the, uh, we need access to those scales so that those people that are going in at over 95,000 pounds automatically get a fine. Thank you for your attention. Bringing out a senator from the 26.
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to vote for this bill with uh, uh, some on my conscience. First of all, like you in a math class, you take a compass and draw a circle. And then you say, I can't come in. That means I got to hire somebody in another truck, come take some weight off, because I might have a delivery at Family Dollar, Dollar General, or any other vendor. The other thing is, it's strictly agriculture. Well, I've got constituents who drive for a living. And it's about the payload. That's how they make a living. That's how they pay their taxes. That's how they pay the house note, the car note, the car insurance, send the kids to school. And I got a lot of friends that are in dump truck business. So now you tell them, and the ag trucks can't haul no dirt, they can't haul no gravel, and they can't haul no top. So you're going to tell the folks who can fix the roads that they can't haul. And it's about the payload. And the only reason I'm going to vote for it, Mr. President, because it's going to get to the House, it's going to be a conference committee, and I like to be on it. <laughs> and, and the only way you can get on it is you had to vote for it. But we have a bigger problem than that, roads and bridges. We've got to find a way to put the money in the transportation to fix the roads and the bridges. This argument has been going on too long. For the last 20 years, I know. And I've heard from cities and some counties. But let me say to you, that we don't grow pine trees in the city. They are grown in rural Georgia. And you don't get any tax money until those trees are cut to go in your digest. And then we got to haul them out of your county to take them to the mill. So it's a two-way street in this thing. Government don't operate off water. It operate off money. And right now we're finna take money out the pockets of some folks for a year. And y'all know that ain't right. We ought to do what we need to do. We ought to fix the problem. Now, we've had plenty of money that we've been giving away all year about all the money we had. We ought to be giving that money to fix these roads and bridges. We talk about these car plants coming to Georgia. But when they come, you got to put an interchange there. Are we paying for the interchange? Does the interchange <coughs> excuse me? Does the interchange come out of DOT's regular budget? We need to think about that. We are a growing state. We need to do what we need to do and stop making excuses about why we're not doing it. Thank you, Mr. President. You have no questions, Senator. And I believe, I believe we put the House at a distinct disadvantage if I put you on that conference committee right there. <laughs> we wouldn't, and we wouldn't want to do that. We wouldn't want to do that. Recognize Senator from the 27th. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. Mr. President, please. Send that senator to conference with me. I would love nothing more than to serve with him. 
and get more time with my good friend. I think I'd just take a few minutes, y'all, and unpack kind of a little history, um, where we are, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, from 2005 to 2020, before the pandemic, we lived under the current law, um, which is to allow an 80,000-pound truck weight with a 5% variance. So 80,000 pounds and then the variance of 5% brings it to 84,000. I think it's important to note that there is no variance on the interstates. So we're only talking about state and local roads. So if you have a trucker who wants to essentially traverse the state on the interstate system, they're gonna need to be at 80,000 pounds either way. During the pandemic, as the Senator mentioned, as he was presenting the bill, Governor Kemp increased that to 95,000. We had lived under that for approximately three years. And about a week and a half ago, that executive order expired, and we are back to our 84,000 pounds for certain commodities only. I think that's the other important thing to mention, is that the current 5% uh, exemption allowance is only for certain industries. Among those are agriculture and forestry, but it also includes solid waste and concrete and recycling materials and a number of other things. One thing that we heard uh, a lot of testimony about it is universally agreed that increasing truck weights will increase the degradation of our roads. We don't, there's a little bit of disagreement as to how much that would be. We heard everything from a, taking a 20-year road lifespan down to 12 years, or potentially taking a 20-year road span down to eight, 18 years. And I'm not here to litigate who is right because, frankly, I don't know. But what I do know is that somebody is right. And regardless of how right they are, we know that we're going to need to see, to see more funding in the state when it comes to our critical infrastructure. Uh, the commissioner of GDOT gave me a swag estimate that if we were to change to what the House had proposed, that he would need $500 million more million a year for the maintenance on the state roads only. That does not include any maintenance on the local roads, which would also be impacted. And I'm sure all of you have heard from your local uh, county commissioners, mayors, and city councils as it relates to this issue. The other states surrounding us have made significant investments of both ARPA funds and their surpluses into infrastructure. And when I talk about significant, I'm talking about billions of dollars. Not tens of millions, not hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars of one-time funding that they have made with their surpluses. We have, we have as, as a state, have not been able to do that or have chosen not to do that. Um, so our, our infrastructure needs need to be thought about when we talk about these weight changes. Something else we heard about in committee was the safety issue. It was highlighted, a federal department highway study looked at 80,000 pound trucks versus um, 90,000 pound trucks, excuse me, so different than what we're talking about here. But they talked about a two foot stopping dif distance, difference between an 80,000 tr pound truck and a 90,000 pound truck. So I know for me, when I first heard about this issue, I thought that safety would be one of the primary things that we heard about, but I was, surprised, frankly, and encouraged to learn um, that you do not have a significant stopping distance between those two trucks at those two weight limits. In the bill, we contemplated the fact that right now